Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you so much for coming. We're thrilled to welcome Salman Rushdie to the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series and the Microsoft uh, Political Action Committee. He has won numerous awards. He is the author of 11 books, including his latest, Two Years, Eight Months, and 28 Nights, <laughs> which I just couldn't memorize. We're so thrilled to have him. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Thank you. Well, can you hear me? You hear me at the back? Yes? Good. Um, well, hello. That's a lot of you. Um, thanks for showing up, taking time off from all those screens. Um, I'm going to talk to you about this, this other technology. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a very sophisticated piece of software, this. You can interact with it in various ways. Um, without it, without prejudicing the original text at all, you can, you know, you can drop it in water, and it does not lose its data. You know, it's it's actually very very cutting edge this thing. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I'm just going to talk to you about for about 20 minutes or so about this book, and then and then you know answer your questions. I hope, um, and I think they're trying to get a microphone, but otherwise you're going to have to shout. Um, so to, first of all, this title, which is very, very long and hard to remember, and a lot of people at the publishing company said to me, they said that, they said nobody's ever going to remember it, and can you think of a shorter title? So I did think of some shorter titles, and then I thought, you know, that's what this book is called. It's called this. I'm sorry. Um, and and uh, so we left it. And now, of course, everybody does the math, and they work out that it's 1,001 nights, and then they kind of like that. And then the internet being what it is, everybody says it only works if there's not a leap year. <laughs> <laughs> to which my answer is, there isn't a fucking leap year. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, what happened was that I, I mean, it's that kind of a story. It's sort of an Arabian night story, but, but not set back then, set kind of now. And, and at a certain point when I was thinking about it, I found myself asking a thousand and one nights, you know, what is that in English? And so I worked it out. And then it seemed quite pleasing that inside this famous magical symmetrical number of 1001, there's another kind of shapely number of 2, 8, 28, you know? So, um, and sort of a secret number concealed inside the famous number. And so that's why the title is that. And that's why, in the end, I thought it has to be the title, because that's just what it is. Um, and really, one of the origin points of this was that I, I've been very interested in what's something that's happening in American literature in, this, in a generation much younger than me, um, which is the arrival into American literature of new immigrant stories from everywhere in the world. You know, that, that, I mean, American literature has always been inspired by immigrant literature. And, and, and one can think of the old Eastern European Jewish migrations, which brought in a lot of the folk tales and fairy tales of Eastern Europe. And then, of course, the Italian migration has had a great impact on American literature. But now, it seems to me, there are people, there are writers American writers with heritages from really everywhere in the world. So, um, you know, there's Jhumpa Lahiri with a kind of South Asian heritage, um, Kiran Desai, similarly. Um, and, uh, you know, Junot Diaz bringing his stories up from the Caribbean, and, and Nam Le from Vietnam, and Yi Yun Li from China. And, and all these young writers would define themselves as American writers, but what they're doing is bringing into American literature the stories of the whole world. And I think it's been very kind of enriching. 
and nourishing for, for the literature of this country that that's been happening. And I, so I thought, well, you know, I can do that too. <laughs> I thought, I've been, I've been living in New York now for getting on for 16 years, and so I think I count as kind of local. And I've got suitcases full of stories from other places as well, you know. So, so I thought maybe I would unpack some of those stories and you know, kind of throw them at Manhattan and see what happened. And so, yeah, the simple way of describing this novel is that, is that genies attack Manhattan. That, that would be the Hollywood title. Should it, genies attack Manhattan one. Because <laughs> um, as I remember when I, I wrote a couple of books sort of like this, fable-like books, but for younger readers, I wrote one for each of my sons. And I remember my younger son when he read Luca and the Fire of Life, which was a book that I wrote for him. He said, you know, Dad, don't write novels, write series. And I thought, well, that's right, because everything now is kind of one of seven, you know. Um, and I failed to do that somehow. I, I failed to be smart enough um, to write series. Um, but anyway, I, I thought that what I would try and do was to use this, this literary tradition that comes from um, comes from the East, which is a tradition of fantastic tales, and, and, and see what would happen if I wrote a contemporary American, well, the book all doesn't entirely take place in America, but a very large, most of it takes place in New York City, uh, with little variations, little, di little departures here and there. Um, and it was just enormous fun to do, you know. Um, one of the things I felt about those two books that I wrote for my sons, um, Haroon in the Sea of Stories and, and Luca and the Fire of Life, which are kind of young adult novels, um, is that they were the most fun I ever had as a writer. And, and actually the kind of response from readers was, was some of the most enjoyable, pleasurable response I've ever had. Because, you know, young people are very tough readers. If they don't like a book, they don't finish the book. Um, and, uh, and they tell you <laughs> that they don't like it, and they tell you why they don't like it, all of which is you know, difficult. And, and on the other hand, when they do like it, they tell you that too, and, and it can be very rewarding. So when you know, Haroon and the Sea of Stories came out, I would get these letters from, from high schools around the country in which entire classes would have read the book, and they would, send me, they would send me drawings of the characters and hints for plots for sequels. <laughs> and, 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 the, and they would tell me which characters they liked and which ones they didn't like. Uh, and it was just the most enjoyable reader response that one could have. You know? and, and, um, and so I thought, well, let me see what happens if, if I write something like that for grown-ups. Maybe I'm going to get grown-ups sending me drawings of the characters and, and, encourage, and giving me hints for sequels. And I finally get to write a series. Um, anyway, so it starts off from that desire to, to do something which was very pleasurable to do in the past, but to do it for adult readers, not for children. Because, of course, these original stories, these ancient stories, the the Arabian Nights stories and many of the other storehouses of wonder tales of the East, they were not written as children's stories. I mean, they were written as adult stories. Um, and rather like, you know, the Grimm stories were not originally written as children's stories. They were written as adult folk tales. And, and then, then there were children's versions of them. You know? So, I mean, for instance, the, some of the Grimm stories are very harsh, you know, they're rough. And in fact, they're quite often told in very rough language, too. So the famous story of the fisherman and his wife, where the, where the flounder, the magic flounder, jumps out of the sea and grants them wishes until they go too far. And, and actually, the, the thing that go, makes them go too far is when the wife says that she wants to be pope. Um, that's, a, that's a wish too far. And they're, and they're returned to their early poverty. But in in the kind of children's versions of these stories, it says that they're these poor people who live in this, in this poor hut. But if you look at the gr original Grimm stories, it quite clearly says that they live in a piss pot. <laughs> they, they live in a giant piss pot. And then they get these wishes and they have palaces and bigger palaces and even bigger palaces. And at the end, they're back in the piss pot. So, so what I'm saying is these are stories which were not only aimed at adults, they were written in, in adult language. 
And anyway, so that was the starting point. And what had happened to me is that the book I wrote before this had been the opposite of this, really. It had been a nonfiction um, autobiography, a memoir. And that had, so I had spent years, I mean, like three and a half years or something, trying very hard to scrupulously tell the truth and not make anything up. And I just got tired of it. <laughs> I just thought, time to stop telling the truth and start making things up. And so, so emotionally, I, after finishing the memoir, I sort of had this emotional swing to the other end of the spectrum and wrote what is maybe the most fantasticated book I ever wrote. And, and to an extent, it's a reaction against the book before. Um, so, how are we doing? So what it's about, really, in brief, is, is a war. It's a kind of War of the Worlds novel, except the, the worlds, I mean, the War of the Worlds makes one think of invading Martians and H.G. Wells and um, so on, but this isn't like that. This, this suggests that there are two worlds, one of which is ours, and the other of which is a, a, a world inhabited by these supernatural creatures called the jinn, from which the word genie comes. Um, so the jinn is actually the plural. The singular is jinni, which is where genie comes from. Um, so the idea is that, that this other world, the world of the jinn, has been separated from our world for a long time. And then there's, the book begins with, a, with some very large natural phenomena, like huge storms. And the, and the suggestion is that these huge storms somehow break the seals that separate the worlds from each other, kind of open the gateways. And as a result, these very powerful supernatural creatures are able to, to enter our reality and, and then do what the, what the jinn like to do, which is to screw things up. Because that's, that's their nature. You know, the jinn kind of vary from mischievous to malevolent. And, uh, and they're actually very interested in human beings because we are more interesting than them. You know, what, what are the th they may be powerful and be able to fly and turn themselves into sea monsters and eat the Staten Island Ferry, and that happens uh, at one point in the book. Um, uh, but they're essentially not that interesting. Uh, and they find human life to be endlessly fascinating you know, because, because we, are, we are more complicated creatures than they are. Really, they have very little recreational activity. There's no books in fairyland. You know, there's no movies to watch. All they have is sex. So they have gigantic quantities of sex. And then after a few thousand years, that gets boring. <laughs> and and uh, no matter how gymnastic. you know. Um, <laughs> uh, but what they like about us is that we do things other than have sex. In fact, most of us don't have any sex at all. But <laughs> uh, uh, so anyway, they arrive in a spirit of curiosity, but also some of them, uh, the, the so-called dark jinn, arrive in, in, in order to, to try and conquer, to try and conquer the world and enslave it. And then there's a female Jin, who is the main character of the novel in many ways, is a princess of the Jin who actually loves human beings and at one point, hundreds of years ago, had a love affair with a, a human being, a philosopher of the 12th century, and produced a spectacular number of children whose descendants are now scattered all over the world and who she, she, she comes back to look after her, her kids, basically, and to defend her progeny on Earth from from the dark, from her dark counterparts. And, and so she as it were, awakens the magic inside them, and then they, they become the counterforce. And so there's, that's, that's the battle that happens in the book. Um, oddly, particularly oddly for me, really, the book doesn't have an unhappy ending. It's, it's usually quite a hard fate to be a character in one of my novels. <laughs> <laughs> Cause, cause, you know, the, the word goes out at central casting that there's vacancies for, a, for characters in some Rushdie novels. Everybody shows up. Then they realize that they're going to be horribly treated, badly, badly beaten up, and probably killed before the end of the book. And it's a tough fate. But in this book, oddly, the characters don't do so badly. And, and one of the reasons for that was, again, a desire to kind of go against the grain of of the world as we see it in the news, you know, that it would be very easy right now to write a book which 
is in which everything is horrible and then it gets worse and then it ends badly. Um, and, and I thought precisely because of that, let me see what else I could do. Let me see what I could do if I didn't do that. Because one of the things I think, I mean, I, I was a historian by training a long time ago. Um, but one of the things you learn from the study of history is that history is an endless surprise. It doesn't run on tram lines. You know, it, it's, not pre, it's not predestined. It's not determinist. Um, history makes all kinds of weird night, nights moves and goes in very unexpected directions. And it's very difficult to foretell what's going to happen. In fact, I've often said that futurology is the science of being wrong about the future. You know, uh, because, it, because it just is very hard to foretell. And so it seems to me, no matter how dark any given moment in human history might look, um, it's not necessarily going to go that way. And so I thought to ask myself the question of how else could it go? And the, the, light, the later part of the book has something to do with that. I mean, put it like this. If I had said to you in January 1989, that the Soviet Union would not exist by Christmas. You would thought I was crazy, because it seemed absolutely set in stone and powerful and enduring. And, and yet it did, just blew away like sand. And I mean, now somebody's tried to put it back together, but that's another story. <laughs> 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 um, um, but that's what I'm saying about what can happen. Uh, that these enormous changes can happen at very, very high speed. Um, and so you know, the, world, the, 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 the path of events is not set in stone. And, and I wanted to find a way of making an unexpected night's move towards the end, which takes it into some other place, which I will not spoil for you. Or at least I'll oblige you to read the book in order to find out. <laughs> um, um, so that's, that's in brief what it's about. How are we doing? I think maybe I'll stop in a minute and let you ask some questions. Um, I hope it's a funny book. I mean, I think it's... I certainly tried to make it a very funny book. And one of the clues I've got is that my notoriously ferocious literary agent, Andrew Wiley, confessed to me that it made him laugh out loud on the subway. And I thought, if you can make him laugh, then something is OK about this book. <laughs> um, again, I think it's a black comedy, because I think it is, in some ways, even though it's so heavily fabulous, uh, I think it is trying to offer a kind of vision of our times and of what's going on in the world. And of course, our times are not particularly cheerful. Um, but there's a, I have this instinct as a writer to kind of write against the grain of, of the material. So I think if I'm looking at something that's kind of dark and has a potential for tragedy, I find myself having a great desire to write about it as comedy um, or farce. Uh, it can be black comedy or black farce, but I think it still has to be funny. Um, so it's, I mean, somebody said to me it was my funniest book, and I'm not arguing with that, except that I think all the others are quite funny. <laughs> uh, one of the things, for instance, that nobody ever says before they read the satanic verses is that it's funny. And, and one of the things that people often say to me after they've read it is, who knew that it was funny? And the answer is, people who read it knew. <laughs> people who didn't read it had a different opinion of it. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but I've become less interested in the opinions of people who don't read it. Uh, um, so yeah, I mean, I've always, I mean, I, speaking as a reader, I'm not very attracted to books which have no sense of humor. And, and that means that excludes one or two really great writers. You know, George Eliot, not a lot of jokes. <laughs> I mean, I was once on this, this TV book program in which we, they played this kind of party game where everybody had to uh, admit to one, one famous work of literature that they'd never been able to read. And I confessed to never having read Middlemarch. And you would have thought that I'd murdered the Pope. You know, because cause like the next day there were these articles all over the newspaper. He calls himself a serious writer, never, been, never read Middlemarch. And I mean, it's true. I've, I've still never read Middlemarch. You know, I've tried, and I tried to watch the TV dramatization of it. I couldn't, couldn't watch that either. I think there's a problem. I mean, look, I know it's a great novel, but 
there's a problem when, when somebody tries to make their male, their, their leading male character is deliberately characterized as the most boring man in the world. It's very difficult for that not to make the novel kind of extraordinarily boring. Um, and there we are. I will not trash George Eliot any further. I think her, I think, I think her reputation is probably safe from me. But um, so we all have these blind spots, and my blind spot is books which have, I don't mean laugh out loud humor, but books, but, but books which don't have some kind of wry, dark, comic note in them. Uh, if they don't have that, I kind of find myself not loving them. Um, so I try always to have that note there in some, to some greater or lesser degree in, in all the books. And this one apparently quite a lot. So, all right, let me stop there in the way of, by way of introduction and let's talk about whatever you want to talk about. Is there a mic? There's a mic here in the middle and we only have time for five questions. <coughs> Hello, my name is Jessica Hoffman. I'm a journalist and I'm a writer. I'm a writer. I'm a writer. Yeah. Is it working? It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, and I just, you started off your conversation uh, by talking about technology. I'm going to take you at face value there, because I agree. I think books are truly one of the most miraculous pieces of technology. It took a long time to develop. Um, and we work in a technology company, uh, creating all technology for all sorts of things. And um, let's just assume for a moment that, that technology shouldn't exist for its own sake, and it actually should solve real problems. Yeah. My question for you is, what technology do you use when writing, and what do you hate most about it? Oh. Well, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm quite, I like gadgets. You know, so I, so I, I not, I'm not in that sense. Uh, I'm not a kind of luddite writer. Um, I mean, I used to. I've never written longhand, really. You know, I mean, I, I, mean, I do a lot of, I do a lot of note taking. You know, when I'm working something out, I scribble things on in notebooks and pieces of paper. But, but when I'm actually writing, I, will, I mean, it used to be a, it used to be a typewriter, and and then in the mid '90s somewhere, it, it became a computer. And I mean, I found, I mean, I was, I was nervous like many people who switch their medium, you know, from, from one thing to another. I was nervous about beginning to use computers, but very rapidly, I mean, it's like, you know, when you buy a new pen, there's a moment when the pen doesn't feel like you. And then very, and then very quickly, it just becomes an extension of your hand and it just, just writes whatever you want it to write. And I think it was much the same with getting, getting to know how to use a computer uh, you know, to write books. Um, after, a, after really quite a short space of time, it just felt like just, that's just the thing I'm using. And, and of course, it does have the great advantage of making revision much easier. You know, that, that when, you, when you're using a typewriter, you, know, you either have to X out everything or use white and wait for it to dry and then type over it, or, or you have to endlessly rip pieces of paper out of the typewriter and put new ones in. And of course, editing on, on a computer is, is just effortless. And, and I came to feel that that was a big advantage because it actually allowed more time for the actual creative work. You know, the, the mechanical act of revision became so swift that it took away a whole, a, a whole passage of time which was just used in the, in the retyping or whatever. You know? So on the whole, I, I mean, I really liked it. I really liked it. Um, the Moore's Last Sign, which came out in 1995, was the first book I wrote on a computer. And, and ever since then, I have. Um, I mean, I use an iPhone. I don't use that much other stuff. You know, I mean, I have an iPad, which I find I hardly ever turn on. I don't really read. I, I do sometimes read e-books. But it's usually because I've started reading a book and then I have to do this, like travel around the country. And instead of carrying a heavy suitcase full of books, I download them. Um, but I much prefer having the books. And what's interesting is it seems to me that 
the book, the book as an object has shown remarkable resilience in the face of the e-book. You know, that, that when, the e when e-books arrived, there was a, f well, traditional publishers were terrified that they were about to go out of business, you know, because that this was going to take over everything. And, and, and what happened with e-books is that the sales went like this, up to about 17% of the book market, at which point they just plateaued, and they've remained there ever since, maybe even with a slight dip. And that the, the sales of, of ordinary old-fashioned books have not only held up, but there's some evidence that they're going up a bit. You know? So, so this, the object is an incredibly resilient thing. People actually just like it. You know, and, and the number of things that were supposed to destroy books is everything that's been invented since books. You know? You know, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, radio was supposed to destroy books. Television, movies, everything was supposed to destroy books. And none of it has. You know, it, because there's something that people like about this, about holding it and turning the pages, you know. Um, there's something people like about having it on the shelf, being able to see it, which you can't do with an e-book. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's probably not doomed, the book. You know? uh, I think certain kinds of book probably will just become electronic. Like, for example, reference books. You know? and I think that because, because of the enormous advantage of having a search engine. So I think if you've got a, a, a dictionary or an encyclopedia, I, mean, I, I gather that Britannica now only publishes an e-edition and has stopped publishing the hardcover edition. And I'm, that I get it, you know, because if you want to search Encyclopedia Britannica for everything about a given thing, you can do it in five seconds. You know? so, and I can see that that's a great advantage. But for you know, fiction and for you know, creative nonfiction, books like that, I think the market for them, for the actual object, will remain. Um, I don't know what I don't like about that. I don't, I, and I don't like about computers that you have to carry them around. Um, you know, uh, and actually, when I'm traveling, I don't bring a laptop with me. And if I have ideas that I want to jot down, then I actually do go back to using pen and paper. You know, I, take, I always carry a notebook and a pen, and it's, somehow when you're on the road, it's much easier to work, much easier for me to work in that way than on a tablet or something. I, so there we are. That's it. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thanks, Salman, for coming over here today and spending time with us. We really appreciate that, and we're really enjoying your time. So the question that I me and my wife, we both wanted to ask. She's not here today, but she wanted to make sure that I'm asking you this question. <laughs> um, so first of all, me and my wife, and like most of other fellows here, we are great fan of yours. And people like you and Taslima, who makes a lot of controversies. So these days, we don't see that a lot of controversies are happening around you. Is it, we wonder sometimes that has you stopped talking enough truth? Or uh, are you trying to tone down your genre and like write some novels for young kids? Um, you should tell your wife that I haven't in any sense toned anything down. <laughs> um, um, I don't know, you know, I don't want, I, I feel that the problem of the endless connection that's with the way in which my name is yoked together with the name of Taslima Nasreen, I would like that not to happen, please. Because, first of all, I don't think she's a very good writer. Um, and I think her circumstances are very different. And I mean, I think I, I support her courage in speaking up, on, particularly on feminist issues. And she has her own difficulties. But I think we're just separate stories. You know, It's not me and Taslima or Taslima and me. Um, um, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, I never went out there to, get to, to, I mean, I hate the term controversial. You know, I'm not trying to be controversial. It seems to me that what's controversial is the attack, not the book. You know, it's the, the attempt to attack and silence writers. As you know, it's happening in Bangladesh a great deal right now with the murder of several bloggers. You know, um, so, um, that's, it seems to me, what's controversial, not what they are writing. You know, they, they have an absolute right to write what they, what they want, which in that case, in the case of all the murdered bloggers, it was all um, secularist writing against uh, religious extremism. And for that, they were hacked to death with blades. Um, 
Now, it seems to me that we get things wrong when we call the righteous controversial. You know, it seems to me it's, it's the men of violence who should be tarred with that brush. And if it stops happening, I mean, thank you very much. I didn't, you know, I didn't want it in the first place. Um, I think we just live in an age in which the subject changes very fast, you know, and, and I mean, the subject w with me was around for 10 years, which is a really long time. But I'm happy to say the subject changed. Maybe it'll change back, which will not be great. <laughs> but, but, but right now, you know, I, I never go looking for it, you know, I mean, uh, nor do I shy away from it. In fact, I have a very strong view that self-censorship is a great crime. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, literature is a great, a great tradition full of writers who have been heroic in what they have said. I mean, you know, when, when the Russian poet Osip Mandelstam wrote his satirical poem about Stalin mm -hmm. and Stalin was still in power, it was pretty clear that Stalin wouldn't like it. But he went ahead and published it and his life was destroyed by it. I mean, he spent most of the rest of his life in labor camps and died in one. Um, but he still wrote it and published it. And, uh, and so I think self-censorship is a crime against literature, you know, and I think my view is either write your book or don't write your book. But if you're going to write your book, say what you think, you know, and because put it like this, bad writing is not the writer's fault. It's just that the writer isn't very talented. <laughs> Self-censorship is the writer's fault, because that's the one. One is inevitable, you know. That's just that's like being Dan Brown, you know. You can't help yourself. <laughs> um, um, but but self-censorship is a choice. So that that's the thing that you do to yourself. Sorry, I should not be rude about Dan Brown. Actually, why not? <laughs> um, so I think self-censorship is something that must be avoided at all costs. And I think, you know, most writers that I know of any quality at all are very obstinate, bloody-minded people. And, and they don't like to be told what to write and not to write. So I think actually one of the things that I think is kind of noble about literature is that writers will write what they want to write, you know. And, and they don't look for trouble, but if trouble shows up, then, you know, you deal with it. Thanks for answering my question. And tell your wife, everything, tell your wife, everything's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Salman. Yeah. Um, speaking of literature and other writers, I'm curious to who you enjoy reading, who's influenced you, uh, and why? Oh, influ well, what, who do I like as writers and what influenced you? Um, what influenced me? Um, well, I mean, I read, you know, I read, a lot. And I, I mean, I think one of the things, one of the things I would say is that we live in one of the great, one of the unsung heroes of literature is the translator. And we live in an age of great translators. And as a result, a lot of the world's literature is available to us in very, very accessible, attractive form uh, to a much greater degree than ever used to be the case. And so I find that I read a lot of literature from languages which I don't speak. You know, and, and I'm only able to do that because of the quality of translation. So, I mean, I found, for instance, before I ever went to Latin America, I had read quite a lot of the literature of Latin America. I had read Borges and Garcia Marquez and Machado de Assis and many others. And I, I sort of felt, because through those writers, I felt that I knew something about that world. And when I finally was able to travel a bit in Latin America, I thought, you know, it actually is like that. You know, Garcia Marquez, he wasn't making it up. <laughs> it actually is crazy. <laughs> In exactly the way that he says. You know, so, so literature does open those doors. I mean, I have to say, you know, I really have hardly ever, I spent only a few days of my life ever in Russia. But I feel that I know something about it because of my fondness for Russian literature, you know, so uh, both the classics, I mean, both, you know, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, but also um, more recent writers, the writers of the Soviet period and so on. Um, so I think, you know, I would just encourage people to read outside the box. That's my view. You know, it's, it's um, and I know that in the United States, there is a tendency amongst readers to try and read inside the box, to try and read writers who are writing about things that are familiar. 
to Americans. You know, many of those writers are extraordinary writers, like say Jonathan Franzen, for example. You know, but but he's but but those are writers writing about a known world. You know, and 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 I think one of the great gifts that literature could give you is to open up to you the lived experience of parts of the world which are not yours. And, and, it, and it can tell you things which the news can't tell you. You know, you turn on the news and you see, you know, explosions. Um, but, but what literature gives you is, is what it's like to be a person living in these places. What is it like to live in North Korea? You know, well, if you want the answer to that question, the best answer I can think of is in a novel that won the Pulitzer Prize a couple of years ago called The Orphan Master's Son by Adam Johnson, which is the most amazing portrait of life, daily life, you know, inside North Korea. Um, and makes it vivid to you in a way, in a way that a, a news report can't. So, so that's what I, I find. I mean, I do read, you know, I do read um, stuff set in places that I know, but I'm very attracted to reading books about places that I don't know because it's a way of imaginatively entering into those other spaces. You know? um, so that's some of the answer. Thank you. There's only one writer I know who ever said that he didn't read very much, and that was V.S. Naipaul. <laughs> I, I was at a literary event in, in Britain where he was being interviewed on stage and, and somebody asked him more or less the same question that you just asked me. And, and he rather grandly said, I'm not a reader, I'm a writer. <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't know any other writer who would say that. Um, because most of us know that to some extent all books come from other books. You know, that you're your experience of reading shapes your, the, the kind of writing that you end up doing to some degree. Um, anyway, that's V.S. Naipaul, not me. Hello, yeah. Simon. Uh, so a few months ago, there was a bit of a mild disagreement regarding the Penn Freedom Award to the Charlie Hebdo. Sorry, I can't really hear you. Can you speak oh. near the mic? Uh, hi. Okay. So a few months ago, yeah. there was a bit of a mild disagreement, to put it very mildly, regarding the Penn Freedom Award oh, to yeah. Charlie Hebdo. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to hear your thoughts briefly regarding that, the ensuing protest, and more specifically, how can a writer essentially guard against self-censorship when it does seem that the tide, both within society and within the writers, there's a very strong tide in that direction? Well, the way you guard against self-censorship is by not doing it. You know, I mean, it's very simple. Everybody knows when they're pulling back, you know, and, and the thing is not to do it. Um, the Charlie Hebdo business was very, was very disappointing and sad, I thought, because the, the, the right, some of the right, I mean, many, many writers were, uh, were supportive of the awards, the award being given to, to the magazine. Um, and the, you know, the number opposing it was a tiny percentage of the membership of Penn. Um, but nevertheless, there were on that list a number of wonderful writers that I would have, I was very surprised to see them on that side of the fence, you know. Um, I mean, Juno Diaz, Michael Adachi, Michael Cunningham, Joyce Carol Oates, you know, you don't expect them to be on that side of the argument. And all I can say is I think they were badly informed because the argument they were making was essentially that the magazine was, uh, well, to put it brutally racist. That was, that was the argument. And, and that it was obsessed with attacking Islam. And that for that to be happening in a country where the Muslim community was very disadvantaged uh, was uh, a kind of liberal luxury that shouldn't particularly be celebrated. I think that, that was sort of essentially the argument. And the truth is that that's kind of the opposite of what Charlie Hebdo was. You know, Charlie Hebdo was, uh, oh, they also said it was kind of an organ of the state, you know. And the point about Charlie Hebdo is it was always the exact opposite of that. You know, I mean, the reason it's called, I mean, Hebdo just means weekly. But the reason it was called Charlie was for two reasons. One is that the founders of the magazine really liked Charlie Brown. And the other is they really hated Charles de Gaulle. <laughs> um, so the magazine from its inception was anti-state. And... As for the obsession with Islam, there was a Le Monde newspaper carried out a survey of 10 years of Charlie Hebdo covers, there's 523 covers. And they discovered that the number of covers that dealt with Islam was seven. The number that dealt with 
Israel was 14. The number that dealt with the Pope was over 21. The number that dealt with, with Sarkozy and the government was like several hundred. <laughs> and, and the number that attacked the French racist natural front, national front was also in the hundreds. You know, so, so very, very much against the, what was being said, it was actually a magazine that spent most of its time attacking French racism and attacking the French state. So to have that magazine accused of being an organ of the state and racist was just, just provably not true. And, and it seemed to me that these people, after all, were murdered for the crime of drawing pictures. You know, and, and if we can't stand up and defend those people, then what my view is what right do we have to call ourselves a free speech organization? You know? um, and... Uh, right. Outside America, in Europe, people were absolutely bemused by this protest. You know, I mean, I've had any number of writers from like France, Italy, Germany say, what the hell are these people playing at? Don't they understand what's going on? Um, and the answer is no, they didn't, because very many of the people who signed that had never been to France, don't speak French, had never seen a copy of the magazine. Um, and yet were willing in some kind of odd tribalist way to support each other in this, in this attack. I mean, it was, it was really unfortunate. And I mean, in the end, it, everything went off fine. They were, the, the, the gentleman from Charlie Hebdo who came were justly celebrated and, and uh, the event went off perfectly well. But it, it has left some real bad taste in people's mouths that it has left um, a kind of injury to old standing friendships, and things like that. And that, that's, that's sad. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. I have a question about your writing, your writing process. And yeah. just to frame that a bit, I think it was uh, E.L. Dr. O who described it as like driving a car at night. You can see as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. Uh -huh. Or perhaps you're somebody who knows your last line oh, and yeah. writes to that, or you have a set of concepts. No, all right. That you well, let me try and say a little bit about this. Is a question about writing process. How do I do it? I mean, if actually if I knew how I'd do it, I I would have written more books. <laughs> you know, but, um, so th there is something hit and miss about it. You know, there's something about writing which which means that you only really discover what you're doing by doing it, um, and that the book you finish is very often substantially unlike the book you thought you were beginning. Um, I mean, that happens to me quite often. You know, I mean, I, I, when I started writing Midnight's Children, for example, I, I thought I was going to write a novel about childhood, which would, which would have its uh, origin in my memory of my childhood growing up in, in Bombay. And I really thought it would be just that. You know? and, and then at a certain point, which wasn't the point at which I started work, I had this idea of, of the, 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 the central characters being born at more or less the same moment as the independent, the hour of independence of, of the country. And when I thought of that, I thought, oh, you know, that's kind of a, kind of a good idea. But it immediately made me understand that I'd somehow completely changed the nature of the book. That suddenly, you know, if the boy and the country were going to be, as it were, twins, then you had to tell the story of both twins, you know. And, and so suddenly, kind of, history came pouring into the book. And I realized that instead of writing this small, private novel about growing up, I was going to write this other thing which was sort of terrifying uh, in prospect and took me more than five years to get it done. And, and so the book that ended up happening was a much larger uh, canvas than, than I had originally seen for it. And that just happened by doing it. I mean, I, on the whole, just do it like an office job. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very good at working early in the morning I mean, I know writers who do get up at like 5, 6 a.m. and work until lunchtime and then spend the rest of the day 
drinking and playing tennis. You know, <laughs> but, but I, I can't, first of all, I can't play tennis. But, <laughs> um, but I, no, I, and I'm better at working late at night, actually. I mean, one of, the, one of the things I do, I mean, essentially I do like a day, I do like a nine to five. Not, not all the time I have breaks and so on, but essentially I do like a working day. But one of the things I always try and do is at night to read what I wrote that day and see whether it needs fixing. And sometimes that can be a very small fix and sometimes a bigger fix. But I think it's, it helps me to go to sleep with the thing in my head because it helps me start again the next day. And I mean, Hemingway had this line about always write one sentence less than you know. And that's a, that's a very good trick, actually. You know, even if you know exactly what it is, just don't type it out. You know? And you get up the next morning and do it, and then you've started. Um, writers have all these, these, these devices by which they fool themselves into working. You know? um, Hemingway is very good at it, actually. There's a, in Hemingway's interview in the Paris Review, the interviewer asks him at some point about political commitment. And he said, you know, should, uh, should, because this is, of course, the time of the Spanish Civil War, and et cetera. And, and uh, so the interviewer says something like, do you think that writers should have um, strong political commitments? And, and, and Hemingway said, the only commitment a writer needs is the commitment of the seat of his pants to the seat of his chair. <laughs> which contains a great truth, which is that in order to write anything, you've got to sit down. So sit down and don't let yourself stand up. I mean, there are one or two writers who have written standing up. There are very, very few. I think Kierkegaard, I think, either Kierkegaard or Schopenhauer, I don't know, one of them. Um, I know one novelist from New Zealand who has a podium in the middle of his workroom at, at kind of laptop height. And, and sort of paces around it, and every so often goes, you know, types, and then backs away. But mostly, to write, you need to sit down. So that's a t that's a tip. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And you think it's silly until you do it, and then you find it works. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure to. Uh say thank you from Microsoft. Thank you so much for coming. For those of you that are interested in getting Salman to sign your book, he will be signing up at the front. And please help me in saying thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. All right.